thanks to the new Canon Library for, um, for hosting us, as it were. Um, yeah, I'm Cole Akers. I'm a curator at the Glass House. Um, and it's really um, a pleasure to be doing these, um, for us, really experimental um, programs. And I'm really grateful to Fritz um, for joining us a second time. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, joined for his um, really terrific lecture on Annie Adler's um, two weeks ago. Time is so fungible, it's hard to tell. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Glass House is a site of the National Trust for Historic Preservation in New Canaan, Connecticut. Um, it was the former home of Philip Johnson and his partner, David Whitney. Um, and today it functions as a sort of cultural center that presents um, exhibitions, uh, performances, talks, and other kinds of public programs related to art, design, architecture, and landscape. Um, and currently we're working on a project with the Albers Foundation called Pliable Plain, um, where we're recreating um, some of Annie Albers' textiles and using them to sort of um, refashion the interior of um, the glass house. So we're, we hope to share that um, with everyone um, when we can reopen um, to the public. Uh, but meanwhile, um, again, really grateful to have uh, Fritz Horstman, who's um, Director of Education at the Albers Foundation and also himself a really fantastic artist. Um, Fritz, really grateful again to you um, for uh, joining us and, and, uh, and being here. I'll turn it over to you. My pleasure. Thanks, Cole. Um, thank you to the New Canaan Library for hosting this also. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. And um, as Cole said, I'm the Education Director at the Albers Foundation. Um, I'll give a, a, a brief history of what the Albers Foundation is about and, and who the Alberses are, and then we're going to jump into trying some color experiments from Joseph Albers's 1963 publication, The Interaction of Color. Um, the Albers Foundation is a research institution in Bethany, Connecticut, which is a bit north of New Haven. Um, we are centered around these two artists, Joseph and Annie Albers, both German artists born in the 19th century. Um, Joseph Albers was born in 1888 in Batrop, Germany, which is near Cologne, near Dusseldorf. Um, as a young man, he found his way to the Bauhaus, the School of Art and Design that was in southern Germany that existed only from 1919 until 1933. Though he arrived there as a student, he very quickly rose to the position of teaching um, and ran the preliminary course for much of the school's existence. Annie Albers was born in 1899 in Berlin and also found her way to the Bauhaus where she met Joseph. They married in 1925. And so when the Bauhaus closed in 1933 under pressure from the Nazis, the two of them um, were very happy to have an invitation to come to this country to go to Black Mountain College, uh, the Progressive Liberal Arts College in North Carolina. And that was brought about um, appropriately given where we are right now, um, through Philip Johnson, the architect of the Glass House. Um, he had visited the Bauhaus in 1927 and then was back in Germany in 1933 um, and uh, knew that the Bauhaus was closing and had, he liked the Alberses and realized that they'd be a, a great fit for Black Mountain College. Um, so they were invited over, they came to this country in 1933, stayed at Black Mountain until 49, um, at which point they left. Um, and came to Connecticut in 1950 when Joseph was made chair of the Department of Design at Yale University, which is why we are ultimately in Connecticut because they finished their lives here. Uh, Joseph died in 1976, Annie Verdana until 1994. Through almost their entire working lives, they were teaching also. Um, their art was, was first and foremost, but teaching was a very close second. Um, Joseph Albers is probably best known for his work in color, his series of paintings, Homage to the Square, of which he started, he, he made about 3,000 of those paintings um, beginning in 1950 and continuing until the end of his life. Uh, but also he was very well known for his color teaching. He ran a color course, which by the time he was teaching at Yale in the, in the 1950s, it was a famous course that people would from outside of the arts would, would make their way to because it was so well known. Um, but he had started teaching color really when he came to America in 1933. Uh, he had taught uh, basic design at the Bauhaus amongst other things and realized that for him, the best way to teach was to lead students to their own discoveries as opposed to just 
implanting information in the student's mind. And he found that in color, that was uh, a medium where it, it's such a fungible, such a uh, plastic, if you, if you can use that term that way, um, material that you could really allow students to make discoveries through a certain set of prompts. And we're going to try one of those prompts today. Um, by the time he got to Yale in the 1950s, he more or less he knew how that color course looked. There were a certain number of prompts that they would go through and students would make their discoveries through those prompts. And so a discussion about how a book about this class could be made. And so in 1963, Yale Press published Interaction of Color. Um, that book consisted of about 200 color plates that were for the most part reproductions of student projects from Albers's classes. That's to say that if a student answered one of his prompts in a particularly interesting way or particularly, uh, a particularly um, coherent way, Albers might ask that student if he could keep the project and use it in his book. And of course, students were honored by that request and so for the most part, they seem to have said yes. Um, so I'm going to change screens now and you're going to see my hands. Okay, so everything's backwards. So I'm going to constantly be doing things to my left hand that I think are my right hand, et cetera. Um, here we're looking at the very first image from Interaction of Color. Uh, we happen to know that the student who made the original of this um, was named Fred Uminger Jr. in 1953. He took Albers's color class at Yale and when given the first prompt, which was to make one color look like two, this composition was what Uminger came up with. Um, I should also say that uh, I'm working with um, a reproduction from the original press, but it's uh, the exact same dimension. This is not from one of the original um, uh, additions, but it's the, the same basic idea. So you, you see the size relative to my hands. It's a, a good size. You can really see the colors very well. Um, so Aminger came up with this composition. The prompt was make one color appear to be two colors. And we're only looking at this area at the front here. Um, we've got six areas of color. We've got orange, brown, yellow, blue, another brown, and another blue. But let's focus just on the brown. Looking just at this brown, compared to this brown, one of them seems quite a bit darker than the other. I'll give it a moment just so you can think about which one that is, but to my eye, and I realize if we were all in a room together, I would be able to ask you what you're seeing, but I sort of have to answer things rhetorically here. Um, to my eye, this brown feels quite a bit darker than this brown. So something's happening here, and um, cleverly, Aminger put a flap into his composition. So knowing that this looks like two different browns right now, when I lift the flap, we see suddenly that those two browns are the same. So what is one color, in fact, appears to be two colors. And further, both of these ideas are true at the same time. Because the truth of color is in our perception, it's what, in what happens between our eyes and our mind, this color can simultaneously be two colors and one color. Now, of course, there's an argument that it is only one color the entire time. I also accept that that's true. But because what we're interested in here is our color perception, we have to agree that it appears to be two colors right now, and it appears to be one color now. So there's this discrepancy between what you see and what you know. And that discrepancy is really sort of the heart of Albers's color thinking, or maybe his entire educational program beyond color also, um, that what we see, what we perceive, what our mind understands through our senses, can be different than what we intellectually know about the world. Um, he had lots of ways to talk about this. He would say it was a, a visual schwindel, schwindel being the German word for swindle. Um, and so he's tricked you in this way. He's, he's usually we think of a, a swindle as being something negative where you've been 
you know, tricked into buying a, a bad car or pants that don't fit or something. Um, but here you've, you have entered into the agreement that you're looking at a certain number of colors, but in fact, when, when you go to total things up, you've gotten more out of the deal than you expected. So you were swindled. Um, he also would say that uh, this is a different form of math. So a mathematician or a banker might say that one plus one is always two. Okay, I think we more or less can all agree that that is a, a true statement. But if we count each of my fingers as one, visually one plus one could be two, there's still two lines here, or one plus one could be one because they've become one line or one plus one have now become four lines. So again, these discrepancies between what our eyes tell us and what we intellectually know. All right, I'll show you a few more examples from the interaction of color, and then we will start trying things. Um, okay, here we have, there's no flap on this one, but I think you can, you understand the idea the two interior grays are identical to one another in fact, they are, they, if we could remove all the other colors, these two colors would appear to be identical. But because of their relationships that they formed with the purple in one case and the sort of seafoam green in the other, one of these colors feels much darker, one of them feels much lighter. And further, one of them feels that it's sort of shrinking while the other one feels that it's growing, at least to my eye. The one that's surrounded by purple seems to be expanding. The one that's surrounded by the green seems to be sort of contracting. Now I could postulate reasons why my, my psychology is seeing these things, um, but I think the experience of it is the most interesting thing. Or looking at these green grids, certainly one of them appears to be much darker than the other. To my eye, the one that's sitting on the yellow appears darker, the one that's sitting on the blue appears lighter. And also, they seem to be changing in color temperature a little bit, um, wherein the one that's sitting on the yellow, the green that's on top of the yellow, feels cooler, feels bluer. And the green that's sitting on top of the blue appears warmer, more yellow. Green being a color that doesn't necessarily have a defined temperature, where red and blue have pretty clearly a warm and cool connotation, though there are warm blues and cool reds. Um, green is able to sort of shift and go one way or the other. And again, that's because of its context. Um, same basic idea. These two interior browns are shifting. They are the same color, in fact, but they appear very different from one another because of their relationships. Our here we have another flap in this one. Let's focus just on these purple areas. Now, certainly this purple feels to me much darker and this purple much lighter. Um, so much so that this purple seems light enough that it might be this purple. There's enough space here that I can almost believe that that purple is the same as that. But when I bring the flap down, you see that in fact, these two purples are the same purple. And this is a pretty long way away from being the same color as that. You can see there how high that contrast is. But when the flap comes up again, you see just how different those feel. So again, the, that discrepancy between what we see and what we know. All right, last example before I start making things. Again, the two interior rectangles appear to be very different from one another. There's no flap here, but you I think intellectually can see what's going on there at the same time as perceiving how different they are. All right, so to do this, to try to try this ourselves, um, some of you may, may have materials at home and you're going to, to participate alongside us and that's great. 
Um, if you are just here to watch, that's absolutely fine also. Um, usually, if I was teaching this class in person, um, students would have what's called color in paper, um, which is a commercially produced variety of, of paper where you get lots of different colors of paper all at the same time. And of course, I can't expect all of you to have color in paper in hand. So instead, I have changed the format so that um, you can use materials that you may have around the house. So I've collected lots of um, napkins and placemats and, and solid color t-shirts. Things that have a solid color don't have a lot of undulation or printing or patterning on them, um, which I can use as my background colors. And then I have collected uh, lots of scraps from magazines, um, and then I also have lots of pieces of construction paper that I'll be able to cut samples from. And so basically, we are going to start by making compositions that look similar to this, wherein the big green area and the big gray area here, or brown area, uh, will be made up of my fabric samples, because I'm not planning to cut my napkins and t-shirts up. And then the small areas on top will be made up of uh, scraps that I cut from magazines and from construction paper. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get started cutting out some samples. What I'm gonna do is create sort of a color library. Um, so I'll, I'll cut out lots of little pieces and lay them out in front here and then we can work with them. So this period is going to be a little uh, bit of me just cutting and if, this could be a good time if people have questions. Um, I will pull up the question bar so I can try to answer those if they come in. Um, question, I'm happy to talk about the Alberses or anything else. Um, or we can, just, we can all sit in silence while I cut up old boxes of vitamin C. Um, to do this, I'm going to need two pieces of each. So again, if we're looking back at this example, um, because both of these are the same color, I'm gonna need two of them to make the, the example happen. But if you are participating at home, you again, you're gonna want flat colors. Um, so this, this covers that lots of areas of the sort of gray green and I can get two little pieces out of that. And I don't necessarily, I, I can go for bright colors if I want, um, but, but less bright colors might be good also. Hey Fritz, we have um, one question that came in. Um, someone says that they're using a color aid and wonders if there are different instructions for that. Okay, yes, great. Um, Carolyn, thank you for your question. Um, if you have color aid, lucky you, um, you could more or less do this the same way. Um, yes, what I would recommend, Carolyn, is um, I don't want you to cut up your entire pack of color aid by any means. Um, but if you cut just, if you have, let's say this was, I realize you don't have color aid that's nearly this big, probably. You probably have something much smaller. Um, but if you did have something this big, you could cut just sort of a thin strip off of the side of your color aid and then cut that in half or into whatever sizes um, so that you can do the same thing without burning through all of your color aid. Color aid is amazing stuff, but it's also a bit expensive. And so I don't, I don't want people to, have to burn through it too quickly. But if you've got it, by all means, use it. Uh, now is the time. Um, I see another question about color blindness. Um, color blindness is um, a fascinating thing. So it, 
Albers, as far as I know, never talked about colorblindness himself. In teaching this material for, uh, I've been teaching it pretty consistently for about five or six years, but I've been working on it longer than that. Um, I have had, I'd say probably 10 students come through my workshops or classes that I became aware, either they told me or somehow it came out, that they were colorblind. And um, usually it was a red green colorblindness. So there was one person who had almost complete colorblindness. Um, and this, the material is still accessible. Um, we're going to start to talk about the various qualities of color um, and we'll get to those soon. Uh, one of those qualities is value, which is lightness and darkness. Um, and the, the students who are dealing with colorblindness in whatever way often gravitate to really leaning on value. And that's totally fine. Speed things up. I'm going to move into my construction. Um, so, a question about Albers and Itten. Yes, they were colleagues at the Bauhaus. Um, Johannes Itten was the exact same age as Albers. He was born in Switzerland. Um, and he was actually already at the Bauhaus when Albers arrived in 1920. In 1920. Um, and he was actually running the preliminary course when Albers arrived as a student. And because they were the exact same age, Albers had a little bit of um, frustration that he needed to take this class from his exact contemporary. Uh, when Itten was asked to leave the, the Bauhaus in 1923, Albers had already started teaching and so was put in charge of the preliminary course, or started teaching a larger role in the preliminary course at that point. So yes, they were colleagues there. As far as I know, they never interacted personally again. Um, interestingly though, uh, so Itten taught color um, and published a book on color, which came out the exact same year as um, uh, the interaction of color in 1963. And when it, when it came out, Itten's book actually did much better than Albers's book. Uh, it got better reviews and et cetera. It was generally um, just doing better, which of course um, rankled Albers yet again. Um, but within a few years, the Interaction Color had gone into a paperback edition and has never gone out of print since then. Um, it's now in, been published in um, over 20 languages and it has been one of the best-selling art books of all time. All right. Just a couple more colors and then we'll start comparing them. All right, so I have here, oh, something like 12 or 15 colors, and I've cut two of each. I'm gonna put these up at the top of my screen. Um, maybe we'll have time for some more questions later, but I wanna get to the material here. Um, all right, so basically, I'm gonna start by um, picking a couple of colors to use as my background colors. I've got this green t-shirt. And let's compare that with a brown napkin. Okay, so these as my background colors, I'm gonna to try to pick a color here that can sit on top of both of these colors and appear to be two different colors at the same time. Um, well, let's try, I'm gonna find a feeling, maybe that's so close it's not gonna work, we'll see. So this is sort of a maroon color. You can see it's the same color when I hold it there. If I put it on top of this green t-shirt and the brown 
napkin at the same time, you can start to see just how differently they feel. I think that there's a bit of reflection going on here, but more or less it's still working. Um, to my eye, I see that the color that's sitting on top of the green feels quite a bit darker while the color that's sitting on top of the brown, let's see if I make, mm, all right. That is working, however, I do see a reflection. So I'm gonna to move to some things that don't have so much shininess in them. All right, so this is a sort of a cardboard color brown. And it's to a degree it is working. It's not super exciting. If I put my eye right in the middle of the two background colors and just let my eye sit there, I can start to perceive that these two colors are shifting a little ways away from each other, but not all that convincingly. So the great joy of having all of these colors in front of me is that I can quickly rotate through different colors. Um, instead of needing to mix more paint or stretch a new canvas or whatever that might be. Okay, so this combination seems to be working much better. So much so that I'll show you that they in fact are the same color green. They sit on top and suddenly, I mean, wow, that's amazing. This seems so much darker, this seems so much lighter. The, the relationships that are being formed between these colors um, are complicated. And to try to pick those apart, I'm gonna introduce three terms. Um, and those three terms are hue, saturation, and value. Those are three qualities of color that every color has. Um, and further, everything that you can see, every, everything in your world that, that you're able to visually see is made up of color, the appearance of it has color, and so those objects all have value, saturation, and hue. Hue is, is really just the name of the color. It is, if it's red or green or blue or brown or yellow or whatever, if you can identify the color name, that is its hue. It included brown there, brown's a, a sort of a dubious one. So strike that from the list. Um, you could also think of sort of the color wheel, which many of you have probably seen, or maybe you know it very well. Um, the colors that are around the outside of the color wheel are the colors hues, or the color hues. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. Saturation is how strong a color is. If a color is completely saturated, that is the color at its strongest possible form. So this green, for example, the one that I'm pointing at, is a very saturated green. It's sort of, it's about as strong, as strong as a green can be. Whereas the green that's next to it has had white mixed into it. Um, still very much a green. We all agree that that's a green hue, but it has been weakened or desaturated by having white mixed into it. Um, the other way you can desaturate a color is by adding black into it. You can of course add both black and white, in which case you're adding gray, which is probably what's happened to this green. So it's a desaturated green, it's got a bit muddy, um, so probably both white and black mixed in, potentially some brown is mixed in there also. Um, all right, so we've got hue and saturation as these qualities of color, and a third quality of color is value. Like I said earlier, um, when I have a question about color blindness, um, if you aren't able to see hue, which is what most color blindness is going to be, um, then value, the lightness and darkness of a color becomes the important thing. So by value, what I really mean is how much light is bouncing off of a color back into your eye. And because our color um, experience happens inside our eye, the only thing that's important in our color experience is how color gets to our eye and how we then perceive that by our brains. Um, and that's to say that if two people are in a room together, they may have a different experience of the same color because the light that's bouncing off of that painting or that chair or whatever um, is going to be uh, different for two different people because where the window is or where people are in relation to the light source or whatever. 
um, but very basically a very dark color, very low contrast color, or very low value color is going to not reflect very much light. So like black or dark purple doesn't reflect very much light. Whereas this yellow here or this manila or white or the table beneath it, all are fairly high value. Um, so a lot of light is reflecting off them back into my eye, back into the camera, which gets to, the, to your screen and then into your eye. Um, Okay, so three qualities of color, hue, saturation, and value. In this particular relationship that we've just got set up here, um, brown is, in this case, I'm going to say it's probably a sort of a version of orange, maybe, maybe a very black and yellow, but brown is a complicated one in that it's usually a mixture of a few different things. However, we certainly have two different greens here. Um, green in the background and green in the foreground. So these two greens are quite similar to one another. And that expresses itself by a very low contrast between these two colors, whereas this is a much higher contrast. So the relationships that are being formed are all a matter of contrast. Um, whether you have a high contrast in this case or low contrast, and then what those contrasts are. The low contrast here is happening in part because they're both green, so there's very little contrast in hue. There is a bit of contrast in saturation, um, in that this seems to have more black, this seems to have maybe more white in it. Um, and there's a little bit of, of um, contrast in value, that this, I would say, is a little bit darker than this but there's contrast in almost every category over here. So contrast of value, this seems much lighter, this seems much darker. Contrast of hue in that the brown is whatever its parent color is, it's not probably green. Um, and also in saturation, that whatever's mixed into this is a different thing that's mixed into this. This seems to be a stronger brown than this is green. Okay. I realize it's a lot of words there. I will try to continue using those words as I go um, to, to help make that clear. Hey, hey Fritz, if you don't mind, um, could you clarify the difference between value and saturation? The difference between value and saturation, sure. Um, and this can be a, a, a tricky point. Um, if you, let's see, so, Value being how light or dark something is, saturation being how strong something is, often how strong a color is. Often those two can go hand in hand. So for example, if you had purple, if you had a fully saturated purple and you mixed it with white progressively until it got to be completely white, you'd have a sort of gradation between purple and light purple and then white. And that would also be a gradation that tracked perfectly in terms of value. So the dark, the, the fully saturated purple would be the darkest color in that spectrum, and the white would be the lightest color in the spectrum, and so value and saturation would work, would be more or less the exact same thing. Um, but for example, yellow, if you if I just said the word yellow and purple. Sorry, was there something else? Right. Oh. No, no, go ahead, sorry. Okay, okay, it's okay. Um, whereas yellow and purple, if I just said those two things, you would assume, I would assume that the yellow is the higher value and the purple is the lower value, um, and that purple is going to be darker and yellow is going to be lighter. But you can imagine, so this, are, this is a fairly light purple here. It's a fairly desaturated purple. And if I put it next to this yellow, which is a fairly saturated yellow, starting to get into a questionable territory there, whether which one of those is higher or lower value. So this being, if this is probably a purple here, something close to a purple, no doubt this purple is lower value than this yellow. It's definitely darker, this is definitely lighter. I'm less clear about this one, that this, this purple might even be lighter than that yellow. And that's, a, that's because of both saturation and value are in the conversation at the same time. I realized that that can get a bit hairy. Um, I hope that that was helpful. Um, all right, so returning to this example, not only can I change the colors out on top, I can change out the colors beneath 
very easily. Um, in the interaction of color, one of the first things Albert says is that this will be done with colored paper as opposed to um, paint. He wanted students to be able to access the material immediately and the material is color. Uh, he was a painter himself, so he certainly understood the value of knowing how to handle paint. Uh, but to be a good painter requires a great deal of skill and it requires maybe years or decades of practice. And all of that can get in the way of um, your experience of color. So by removing that obstacle, removing the need to know how to use paint, you are able to get directly to color without having to learn how to mix paint or paint straight lines or do all of the messy things that come with learning how to paint. That's not to say that these experiments can't be done with paint, um, simply that Albers recommended that you start not using paint. Um, there is a digital version of this. Um, Yale Press a few years ago created an app for the iPad, just simply called Interaction of Color. Um, and I still think that it's much better to work in paper, or in this case, fabric and paper, but work with, with materials to really sort of be exploring how things look right in front of you. But um, in, in absence of that, or in addition to that, the iPad app, I think is a, is a good resource. And you can work through ideas very quickly there. So I traded out the brown for this light blue, and you can see how dramatically the thing shifted. These two colors still feel quite different from one another, but where here the value change was, this was lighter, this was darker, now it's reversed. So this is now darker, this is lighter, which interestingly makes this now feel darker. So things have, have flip-flopped that way. Um, or I can try out something that's not green. Does that still work? Yes, it does. Interesting. Okay. So I will also say I've been teaching this material for a long time and have taught the workshop hundreds of times. I am always surprised by something that happens. So here we've got this kind of this muddy green sitting on top of orange in one case and light blue on the other. And I start to see a hue change. And by hue change, I mean that um, it's not a value that's shifting. It's not that one's getting lighter and one that's getting darker, but perhaps that might be happening also. I see more that this one is feeling, I'm going to say greener, and this one is feeling oranger. And again, this can be best seen by putting your eye in the center. So I put my eye right in that center. This one starts to feel green or maybe sort of a turquoise color perhaps. Again, keeping your eye here and just looking at that in your peripheral. And on the other side, it is showing a lot warmer tones, more of a yellow or orangey version of green. Okay, interesting. Let's see what happens. What if we put this purple on top of the two? Now, that was not a complete random choice. I had, I had some idea what, what, what might happen. I'd seen the hue shift happen with that green. And so I thought to myself, what other color could shift in a similar way? And if I, again, if I put my eye in the middle, the purple, right, these, are, these two are the same purple. If I put my eye in the center, the one on top of the orange takes on a much bluer appearance. And the one on top of the blue takes on a much purpler or redder appearance. So the same color purple is able to sort of split and go two different directions. One is getting cooler, one is getting warmer, one's getting redder, one's getting bluer. I suspect that some of you may have spotted what is going on there. Um, purple, if you have mixed paint before, you know that purple is a mixture of, can be made by a mixture of red and blue. And so my two background colors here are in fact the constituent colors that could make a purple. So we could say that there is a bit of red and blue in both of these purples. And in a sense, in a, in a way of thinking, the, the red is being pulled out of the purple here and, it's being pulled, and the blue is being pulled out of it here. And so this single color sort of been able to draw itself apart in this case and make itself into two different colors. Okay, 
Uh, well, let's keep going. Let's see if we can find some other combinations that do interesting things. Try that one again. Still working, but not in the same way. It doesn't have that dramatic blue to purple effect or blue to red effect. Um, what about this color? It's so, no, I think it's going to be too close. It's basically the exact same color. It is. It, in fact, just disappears right into that. So disqualify that one. So in the terms that we've been talking about, and this one mm, doesn't work all that well. Um, and perhaps it, well, it doesn't work. I'll put it back so we can talk about the failure of it. Um, both of these background colors are very light. Um, got a tan and a light blue. And this gray that sits on top, it is the same gray. And it up here, it doesn't really seem to shift very much as I move it. The dominant characteristic of the colors that is, is in working here is value. There's a huge value change between both of these. And the, the difference in value between this and this and this and this is more or less the same. And that may be such a strong uh, contrast and such an equal contrast that it's blowing everything else out and we can't see any of the other relationships. Um, but if I bring in my little pieces of manila, hmm, well, that doesn't work either. Hmm. Hmm. Perhaps these two colors are just too close. So I think it is, it is useful to have failures in the examples so you can see that not every color combination works. However, from a teaching perspective, I only want a few failures today, like mostly success. Hey, there's a winner. Um, so the same color brown sitting on top of two different browns. So we start to see an interesting relationship that Albers and others would call simultaneous contrast, where the relationship here, the contrast that's happening here, is informing the contrast that's happening here. So we see how different these two are, and that amplifies the difference here, and the difference here then amplifies the difference here, and back and forth. And these two things, it's sort of a positive feedback loop. Because we're dealing only in browns, um, we can consider this to be, we've sort of removed hue from the conversation. So those three characteristics being hue, value, and saturation, because everything is of the same hue, whatever hue brown is, um, we don't have to worry about that. We know that there's no contrast of hue. We can see that, that there's a value difference here and a value difference here and a saturation difference here and a saturation difference here. And so more or less in this case, because we're working in the single hue, value and saturation are tracking together. So darker here, lighter here, lighter here, darker here. Again, that simultaneous contrast is allowing this thing to feed into itself. It's almost enough that this, I'm sorry, this color appears to be the background color here. Do you agree that this is looking so light in comparison to this brown, this, back, this dark brown, that it appears to be this background? Okay. Um, but could that happen with, well, this, let's look at this gray that, that failed us earlier. Will it work here? It does, yeah. So if you recall the, the a problem, the problem that I proposed anyway last time was that the value change was so dramatic between the gray and both of its background colors that it couldn't work. But here, that huge contrast in value is, is contrast. It's a contrast of contrasts here. 
um, with a much lower value change here. And so we're able to see these two things happen at the same time. This seems like maybe it's a good one. We can see how many we can change at the same time. Um, the question you may have now potentially is, well, what, where do you go from here with this material? Um, well, you could continue making this experiment forever, um, or you could complicate things. So I'm now adding more than one color and the green is also working. Um, this color that disappeared earlier, that also works, seems much darker here, much lighter here. Yeah, that Manila, I don't know about that. Maybe, eh, there's a little difference, but I think potentially because it's so much lighter than both of them, that sort of what, we've, what we'd seen earlier with the dark gray and its contrasts is now we're seeing the reversal of that. This, this yellow, this Manila is so much lighter than both of them that there's not enough contrast of the contrasts. So I reject that one. Yeah, the purple works. I know what you're thinking. I'm just showing off now. I'm showing you how many I can do all at the same time. Ooh, that was nice. I like it. Look at that. Okay. Um, all right, so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I want to, I see a bunch of questions are popping up here. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Burley Brown asks, is tertiary color a hue as well? Um, yes, so by tertiary colors, um, those are the mixtures of colors. So the, the, the six colors that I had listed, um, initially red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple are the primary and secondary colors of the color wheel. I don't wanna get into a great discussion of what the color wheel is because that's, um, well, it's hard to do without an example in front of me, um, but also the color wheel sort of represents a color system and comes with, with some potentially some color rules and Albers was very much against color rules. Uh, historically, the, the color wheel was invented by Isaac Newton, um, published first in, I think, 1702. And Newton, um, who did a lot of his best work during a quarantine of a plague, uh, set out this color wheel, and there's much more to be said about that, but he actually included red, orange, yellow, green, uh, blue, indigo, and violet, he'd split purple into two, these two different colors. So he had seven colors on his color wheel versus the, the six that I just listed. And that, there's much more to be said there, but he did that because he was so confident that the colors would correspond to the notes of the Western scale in music, uh, that there needed to be seven colors to correspond to the seven musical notes. That, Theory has been tested and tested and no one has yet been able to um, come up with a convincing uh, version of colors directly corresponding to musical notes, but that's an interesting topic. In any case, Newton gives us the color wheel in the, uh, around 1702 and uh, for decades, for centuries after, People said, yes, Newton has done it. He's nailed it. He's given us color. Color has now um, been drawn into science in a way that we can quantify. We don't have to worry about color anymore. We've got it figured out. And for many people, this was very satisfying and it did certainly produce lots of interesting ideas. But uh, about a century later, the German polymath, Johannes Wolfgang von Goethe, um, was, was dismayed by this. He thought that Newton had taken all the poetry out of color. Actually, I'm gonna, because I'm probably just gonna be talking, I'm gonna spotlight myself again, so you're not just looking at my hands. Um, so Goethe uh, thought that Newton had taken all of the poetry out of color by giving us these rules, and Goethe famously said, there is no theory of color, look only to the blue of the sky, that is the theory of color. And that's a fairly enigmatic thing to say, but it certainly, it, it points to the poetry 
of the experience. And what I think that is, is that you really need to be tuned in to color in order to understand color. And simply reading about it or memorizing rules is not the way to understand color. Um, and Albers certainly puts himself in line with Goethe, um, Goethe being Germany's favorite German. Um, Albers would have gotten a lot of Goethe in his schooling. Um, and certainly uh, adhered to those ideas. And in terms of his progressive ideals of education, this made perfect sense that memorizing rules is sort of the antithesis of a progressive education, whereas a liberal education or a progressive education, um, a student discovers one's own rules or own instincts or develops their own theories through these things. Um, so Albers putting himself in line with Goethe uh, is to say that he was going to be opposed to rules and though he certainly knew about the color wheel and much later in the semester he might have taught the color wheel or other color systems it was really just a point of contrasting what a color system is versus the color experience that he'd been teaching um, the interaction of color um, the book more or less comprises a semester's worth of, of work as albers was teaching color at yale um, but, sorry, I wandered way away from the question. Um, tertiary colors, which would be colors that are mixed between, let's say, blue and purple, so a blue-purple. Um, certainly you can have a fully saturated blue-purple. Um, anything that's on the color wheel, on the outside of the color wheel, uh, you, you could say that could be fully saturated or you could imagine it being desaturated. Okay, um, da, da, da. Is saturation intensity? Yes, it is. Intensity and strength and saturation in color terms come fairly close to, to being the same thing. Um, brightness versus dullness, perhaps. Um, but bright then, because it's the same word we're using to apply to value, I would say, as opposed to dull, which we could say is muted, might be muted versus loud. Um, so I hope that helps. I, and I recognize the, the stickiness of the, the saturation value question. Um, does Albers speak about color vibration? Yes, he does. Um, this, there was a, um, a term that he used called soft edge, hard edge. And looking if there's any examples in front of me that show that. Uh, a little bit. So I'm going to go back to my hands for a minute. Uh, so we've got all these examples here. I'm going to uh, isolate just these two. There's a much harder edge here and much softer edge here. Um, so lower contrast, higher contrast. You could say that there's more vibration here and less vibration here. I'm working in pretty muted tones here. We're all in browns. But you could, let me see if I can quickly come up with a, a stronger example. So this blue purple sitting on top of this red, both are very saturated. And there's sort of a visual vibration here. The much higher contrast, much more um, sort of visual electricity than there would be in this contrast. So we could say this is a vibrating boundary and this is not. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through questions. All right, a, a not a stupid question. That's how it begins though. How do you ultimately apply this method to paint? Does this make you a better colorist? Veering away from saying better painter. Um, well, one could certainly apply this directly to paint if you were, let's say a hard edge abstract painter along the lines of Joseph Albers, then this would be easily applicable directly onto your painting practice. Um, if you were not interested in that sort of thing, um, if you were say a portrait painter or a, you know, still lives or I don't know, any, anything else, um, this might not apply directly into your practice. When 
Joseph Albers came to this country in 1933. Um, he and Annie were together. Annie spoke fairly good English. She had grown up with an Irish governess or, or um, servant um, who taught her English. So she spoke a fairly proficient English. Um, she said she spoke English like a 14 year old. Joseph Albers had almost no English. So he arrives in Black, at Black Mountain College in 1933, and Annie, by and large, served as his translator, but you know, he needed to quickly pick the material up. And um, as, as you would if you're in a new country, and he was asked by a student early on what he was going to teach. And in that way that a non-native speaker might cook something up that's particularly poignant, he said, I am here to open eyes. And that went over very well. So he repeated it thousands more times and I now repeat it thousands more times. Um, and by that, he did not mean that he was there to pry people's eyeballs open. What he meant was that he was there to expand your perception, your ability to, under, to see what you're, to understand what you're seeing and to enrich that experience. So whether that's in color, he chose color because it was such a malleable medium, such a good medium to really make these examples. But many of his students at Black Mountain were not going to go on to be artists. They were at a liberal arts college. So they might be studying to be a historian or a elementary principal or something else. Um, he knew that these students might only take this one class and for them the opportunity to see how rich the world was and know that they could sort of pick that apart was the point point. and so by learning this color experience i suspect that you're going to go out into the world after we get off well it's after 12 now so i'll wrap things up quickly um after we finish i suspect you may be able to sort of go in just looking around your home and say, oh, look at that color relationship. Look how high the contrast is there, how low the contrast is there. Sorry, I've got a weird reflection there. Um, and maybe you want to, maybe you can find these sort of relationships happening around your home. Um, but it applies beyond color, right? Like the, this sort of, the relationships that color form are very analogous to the relationships that humans form or that other visual things form. Okay. I'll get one more question and then maybe we can. Okay, an interesting question between Albers and um, Emily Noyes Vanderpool. Um, so Vanderpool uh, was, um, let's see, a, a woman who, a Manhattanite in the late 19th, early 20th century, who split her time between Manhattan and Litchfield, Connecticut. Um, a city that the Alberses loved also. So there is at least a historical connection between the two. As far as we know, Albers had no idea about Vanderpool and Vanderpool was a generation before Albers and so she couldn't have known about him. Um, however, her writings have recently come to scholastic attention um, and there are certainly correspondent, not, not correspondences in they were writing letters, but uh, there are corresponding ideas between the two. So if this sort of material is interesting to you, um, I certainly recommend that you get the Interaction of Color, the book. I don't have the paperback here in front of me, but um, the paperback is, it's something like $20 um, and easily accessible. Um, but Vanderpool's book is also a great one. Hey, Fritz, um, before, before we let you go, um, could you maybe talk a little bit about your show that you've um, organized at New Britain? Oh, sure. Yes, so, um, in addition, so there's lots of things about the Alberses that are going on. And at the beginning, Cole mentioned the collaboration between the Glass House and the Albers Foundation, wherein um, we are reproducing some of Annie's textiles that will be implemented into a, an exhibition project at the Glass House later this year. Um, and that will overlap with an exhibition that I've curated at the New Britain Museum of American Art. Um, it was meant to open on March the 19th, and unfortunately the museum had to close because of COVID-19 on March 17th, and so that exhibition has not yet been open to the public. 
but we are hopeful that sometime in the coming months, the exhibition will be able to open. Um, so the exhibition is called In Thread and On Paper, Annie Albers in Connecticut. Um, Annie was primarily known as a weaver in her lifetime, but the, she transit, she, when they moved to Connecticut in 1950 and she lived here for another 44 years. And that, those years were her most productive years. Um, she wove very actively for another 20 years and then transitioned fairly abruptly into printmaking and spent about 20 years as a printmaker. And so the exhibition tracks the, the move she made from being a weaver into a printmaker and also her work as a designer. Uh, so that is in New Britain at the New Britain Museum of, of American Art. Uh, our hope is that it will open and then be able to stay open for about three months. That was the initial plan. It would be a three month run, but there are a lot of things that we can't predict about the world right now. Well, Fritz, thank you so much for this. This has been so wonderful. Yeah, and, very um, Yeah, I hope you um, stay healthy and optimistic and um, hope to see you again very soon. I hope so too. It's been a great pleasure. And though I'm not, I didn't get to answer all of the questions. There were lots of good ones. Um, great to see so many of you in there in, in the question comment bar and also so many participants. So nice to see you all and everyone stay healthy, please.